Well, thank you very much uh, for, for hosting me and inviting me to be here. This has been a wonderful day. I've learned a lot. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to share with you a little bit of the research um, that I've been doing at the J. Craig Venter Institute. Um, so to give you just a little bit of background, um, I'm not a biologist. Uh, my background is in physics and material science. Somehow I wound up at a genomics institute. Um, but uh, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to learn more about environmental microbiomes and specifically how we can put them to work. Okay. So what I'm going to start with today is um, an, an introduction <coughs> into how microbes actually will communicate with each other electronically. So what I'm most interested in is how microbes um, can interact with solid phases either to respire or to gain energy through oxidation of those solid surfaces. And so broadly defined as extracellular electron transfer, we're studying how electrons move through communities and ultimately to terminal electron acceptors to facilitate life. So I'm going to focus first on um, electrons moving out of the community, so uh, microbial respiration through extracellular electron transfer. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about how we can uh, look at the opposite side with organisms, communities of organisms, taking electrons from solid state donors uh, to, to synthesize products like methane. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can put these communities specifically to work in scalable uh, applications for sustainable sanitation. Okay, so um, the way I think about microbes is really uh, defined by uh, the redox scale and, um, and how we can exploit various potentials to enrich for different types of organisms. So specifically, uh, you know, organisms that are going to oxidize organics um, coupled with organisms that may respire solid surfaces or denitrify or reduce sulfates or even uh, respire oxygen. And so studying organisms in bioelectrochemical systems uh, allows us to actually define biofilms at a specific redox potential and study, okay, how are they moving electrons in and out of uh, the cell and ultimately perhaps between uh, different community members uh, existing at that redox potential. And then we can change those redox potentials and see how organisms respond. Uh, so I'm interested in that from a fundamental aspect. So utilizing bioelectrochemical systems uh, to study microbial ecology. But then ultimately, once we understand how these organisms function um, in response to different redox control, how can we put them to work? And so uh, using microbial ecology specifically for developing technologies. So the bioelectrochemical systems, uh, so this is a, a real generic cartoon about how it works. Um, so you have an organic that will come in. Uh, we could also utilize hydrogen, uh, but typically we're using, we're looking at uh, complex organics. Um, then these uh, uh, organisms that will form biofilms on our electrode surfaces will begin oxidizing the organics and utilizing uh, the anode electrode specifically as a source for respiration. So this is an anaerobic environment. Uh, we're not introducing oxygen to the anode. And so really, the, the best electron acceptor there for respiration will be this uh, solid surface. And typically, we're using graphite uh, or, or carbon as our electrode material. Um, it's very stable at neutral pH and, and uh, standard temperatures. Uh, it can accept a lot of electrons. It's conductive enough uh, for us to grab those electrons. And we can mold it into a lot of different configurations so we can optimize the amount of biofilm we get on our surface. So our bugs stick onto our electrodes, oxidize the organics, ultimately to carbon dioxide, protons, which, which are transferred internally uh, through the system, and electrons, which are conducted across an external circuit, uh, producing direct electricity. Then those electrons and protons will recombine at the cathode compartment, and we can have a biofilm, or uh, we can keep this as an anaerobic space, and we bring in an oxidant uh, in an anaerobic condition. The oxidant could be carbon dioxide, uh, and then these organisms will be uh, taking electrons, protons, reducing that carbon dioxide to say nothing. Or we can naturally diffuse in oxygen from air, 
uh, reduce that oxygen uh, to produce a new stream of water. And so uh, we, we study all of these um, possibilities uh, to the extent that we can, um, and, and, and specifically looking at uh, electrons um, out of the system to the anode and uh, electrons into the systems, microbial systems, from the cathode. And of course, we want to exploit their activities as much as possible so we can generate power uh, and ultimately new products. Okay, so I'm going to start with the anode. So oxidation reactions and, and how um, the relationship between uh, how microbes deliver electrons to the surface uh, can be controlled um, by how fast we draw electrons out of the system, we can actually drive their metabolism. So first I'll start with uh, mechanisms. So how does extracellular electron transfer work? So we first started studying this. Um, my first exposure to this topic was uh, in Ken Nielsen's lab up at USC. Um, and we were, of course, studying Shivanella on Identus MR1, which is still my favorite model organism. Um, and this little bug uh, has the capacity to move electrons um, from inside the cell to outside the cell uh, in, with at least three different mechanisms that we know about. So the first mechanism, which was uh, reported in Shuanella, first by uh, Yuri Gorby in 2006, um, is, is this capacity for Shuanella to actually um, produce these type 4 pili, um, which are populated with C-type cytochromes that facilitate electron hopping from inside the cell along the length of the pili and to the conductive substrate. So this is a single uh, fiber of one of our carbon electrodes. So we, we, we still term this um, bacterial nanowires, although some really nice work from the El Mujarab lab at USC um, has shown that uh, these are, um, uh, in fact, uh, membrane extensions. Um, so, so you can see that these, uh, the C-type cytochromes populating on the, on the membrane, which allows just direct transfer from, from the cell onto the surface. Um, it's, it's, it's this uh, full extension of the cell and into vesicles and um, into the environment, so it's pretty cool. Um, without the pili, the function still works, so the C-type cytochromes are upregulated up to the outside of the cellular membrane, uh, come in contact with the conductive surface, transfer those electrons. But Schuanella, being the cosmopolitan, bug that it is, uh, can also excrete uh, redox active molecules like flavin uh, to, to uh, allow for accelerated or um, and or stressful environments uh, movement of electrons from, from the cell to the conducting surface. And in the environment where there's not naturally carbon electrodes, right, uh, this process um, happens uh, mostly to, to reduce our oxidized minerals. And so, um, you know, this process in Shivanella and many other organisms that I've studied um, really drive biogeochemical cycles around the world. So, it all boils down to uh, C-type cytochrome, um, at least in Shivanella. And so, uh, just a, an example of, uh, you know, what these proteins look like. We, we are looking for uh, multi-theme C-type cytochromes Shuanella can encode up to 42 different C-type cytochromes, which are um, up to decathlon uh, quantity in terms of uh, amount of iron that facilitates that electron transfer. So Shuanella is cool, but Geobacter, another wonderful model organism that's studied, and a very strict anaerobe, also encodes many different C-type -type cytochromes, in fact, many more than Shuanella, um, up to um, uh, 111 of them identified so far. And, the, and Schuanel and Geobacter come from very different environmental niches, uh, and so um, have, likely have some very different mechanisms for how this extracellular electron process happens. Um, and there's been some interesting work um, reported over the years that Geobacter also has conductive nanowires, and that in fact that conductive nanowire pili is a more metal-like conducting protein. Um, controversial. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's still a lot of work just looking at specifically uh, into this mechanism. But there's more to life than Schuanella and Geobacter, as, as awesome of organisms as they are. Uh, we're really interested in understanding, okay, the diversity of electron transfer uh, that, that exists within microbial communities 
And uh, through our metagenomic and metatranscriptomic work, we've, we've come to understand a little bit more about this, and that uh, organisms which we don't study in the lab also can encode up to 100 different C-type cytochromes uh, and induce them under different stresses. So uh, the, um, the, the method that we developed in my lab to, to really try and get an understanding about this uh, came from um, Shinichi and, and Shino Yishi, uh, two wonderful people. They're now working at Janstech. And uh, they developed a way to use bioelectric chemical systems uh, as a way to induce stimuli related to electron transfer, and then applying metagenomic and metatransformic methods uh, to look specifically within a very quick time frame um, who are the first responders to the change in redox environment, specifically moving electrons out of the system faster, so a set potential mode. So that anode now is an excellent electron acceptor. There's absolutely no limitation to how fast electrons can move um, out of the microbial community. And then when we switch the system again very quickly into an open circuit condition where no current is allowed to flow and we're forcing whatever microbes are there to figure out some other way to respire or ferment or basically change their lifestyle. So what we did is we, we operated uh, wastewater bioelectric chemical systems. So we grabbed the wastewater sample from a wastewater treatment plant. That was our inoculum source as well as our um, uh, carbon source. So we didn't define any specific carbon source. It was literally everything in the kitchen sink. And we would do a media replacement uh, throughout our enrichment, so new wastewater samples every eight days. So we're challenging the growth of this system by with introducing new mi microbes uh, every week, every other week, uh, as well as the diversity of different carbon sources and studying the enrichment of this community over about two years. We, we did the 16S analysis of that enrichment, um, and then we had to kill the system, we had to sacrifice the system, uh, to do the metatranscriptomic work. And so then we compared our 16S data to our metagenomic data. Um, but really what we're after here is, okay, you know, within a very stable community, if we know the core microbial community wasn't changing, at least based on 16S, um, how are these organisms going to respond based on changing electron transfer capacity? So this is our workflow. Um, that's been published. We can go through that later if you want. Um, and then what we did is uh, we identified about 400 different uh, unique OTUs, and using cluster clustering methodologies, uh, we were able to identify some draft genomes um, up to about 95 percent completeness. Looking at um, now the dominant strains within our organ within our community, we did not see Geobacter as the dominant strain, but we did see a Desulfrobobosubse strain, EV1. Um, we did, we were not able to really clearly cluster our um, desulfromonads, which Geobacter lives in, um, and so we're kind of, we're calling DMs as a, as a pan genome uh, of different Geobacters, uh, and then we had DB2, DF1, and we had methanogens. And methanogens we consider to be a competitive um, relationship to electrogenesis, uh, so we're interested in the fact that we see methanogens still there, um, but when we look at the transcriptomic data, Again, so MFC is baseline. Set potential is accelerated electron transfer, fast respiration. Open circuit, um, no electron transfer to the anode was allowed, so basically um, sh shunting respiration. And so when we look at static expression changes, right, um, what we see a a across uh, you know, the, the various uh, functional pathways, um, uh, you know, we, we do see some uh, activity always happening within the sulfur pathways. We see some activity almost always happening within methanogenesis. But we see changes of activity when we're looking at dynamic expression. The biggest changes that we see are in cytochrome families. So, um, and, and as it turns out, um, we see the biggest changes in cytochrome families um, uh, in, in some of these uh, uh, low and high redox potential cytochromes, which were recently reported by another lab. So our metatranscriptomic data is now matching to uh, model organism data. This is in Geobacter, but these cytochromes that we're seeing in our communities are actually in um, Dysilverobulbus. So cytochromes seem to be around and more often and definitely important for electron transfer capacity, so that's cool. So then, 
we started looking into, okay, so we're changing how respiration happens within the community. How is that impacting uh, metabolism, carbon metabolism specifically? So you saw that we, we had um, uh, you know, various different types of um, phylum within our, our community. We had uh, fermenters. Uh, there's a lot of complex matter coming in. We had guys that would um, perform hydrolysis, opening up the uh, cellulitic material, releasing sugars. Uh, and then those sugars being fermented into volatile fatty acids, right? So we had all of these different populations. And ideally, right, very simple system, this is how it would work, right? Uh, those volatile fatty acids ultimately get oxidized to carbon dioxide, electrons, and protons. What our data showed is it's more like that. Um, and uh, we have a, a, a more rare population of organisms um, conducting uh, fermentation hydrolysis. Um, and then, depending on what condition or electron transfer rate we're allowing to happen in the system, we see preferred trends based on that transcriptomic data about who gets to work with who for transferring electrons around. So, in our baseline condition, right, so just baseline respiration, what we see is that um, we got ethanol production, uh, we see a lot of uh, transcriptional activity from this particular strain, DF1, uh, which seems to be supplying acetate to this particular electrogen, our, uh, our electrogens, our pangenome of, of the desyl monad. But when we switch that activity, when we turn up respiration rates, that changes. And we see acetate being, uh, being produced directly from our fermenters, uh, and then rapidly consumed by DB1, this is again based on transcription, uh, meta, meta transcriptome data. And we see that ethanol gets moved into uh, DB2, which then produces acetate and feeds DB1. So DB1 was the most highly active organism with fast respiration. Uh, the, the geobacters uh, were the most highly active organisms under baseline conditions. But they also had preferred partners in terms of who's supplying the carbon source. And so carbon flow through the, the community also seems to change. So I'll talk to you why, a little bit more about why that's important in just a minute. But so we're getting a better picture of, of what's happening at the anode, uh, both in, in how we can drive respiration, uh, and then how respiration rates will really impact um, carbon oxidation and uh, my, potentially microbial uh, syntrophy. So, so great, so that's oxidation of carbon and extracellular electron transfer out of the microbial community to a solid surface. But what happens here? What if we have a community of organisms now utilizing this surface as their energy source um, and then uh, reducing oxidants like CO2? Do we see uh, similar mechanisms? Do we still see these cytochromes? But you know, what, what, what's going to be happening there? So uh, the relevance to this, uh, you know, is in the environment as well. Uh, there's been reports of, um, you know, electrogenic um, and sulfate-reducing bacteria utilizing minerals to actually pass electrons to methanogens and then facilitating the methane cycle. Um, and then within bioelectrochemical systems, this has also been studied. Uh, multiple mechanisms of electrons getting into the system. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's an enzymatic pathway as well as uh, just direct electrons into the system and mediated. So the major questions we are asking here, uh, so how diverse are the bacterial and archaeal players? Right? So we're looking specifically at methanogens in this case. Uh, so and, and what are the dominant mechanisms within these bacterial communities? How are they cooperating? How are the bacteria and archaea cooperating in, in this type of environment? Um, and then ultimately, if we're changing now access to that electron donor, that solid phase electron donor, how are they going to respond? And so we, we set up our experiments very similarly to what I explained before. But in this case, um, we're controlling the potential of our cathode. Uh, we're using rice paddy soil as our inoculum we're looking for those methanogens. Um, and we, we, we had maintained a, a set working potential at about negative 0.5 volts versus standard hydrogen. Uh, this is important because this is the potential where ferrodoxin is most active. Um, we had a 20% carbon dioxide headspace. Uh, 
We also applied a subpassaging method to try and uh, enrich our microbiomes faster. And then we monitored current consumption, pH, methane production, protein, and uh, did a 16-AS based uh, taxonomic classification throughout the operation. So picture of our reactor, and this is kind of the subpassage uh, methodology. So we have a mature biofilm living on one of three electrodes, which are um, operating together as a system. And then we, we slice off one of the, the biofilm sections, and we move it into a new sterile reactor sandwiched between two new sterile electrodes. Every time we do a subpassage, we collect uh, protein from the surface. We do some confocal imaging to see who's there. Um, collect the DNA uh, and also monitor the pH of the solution. So, uh, reactor performance in time. So, the subpassage happens about every 14 days or so. And uh, what we see is activity start to increase. So, this is um, methane production rates uh, for each subpassage. And then this is the current consumption. So, this is how much uh, energy is being consumed by the community in each subpassage. And we did this in duplicate reactors A and B. So we see an increasing trend, right, in performance. So, okay, let's disrupt the system. Let's see what happens. And uh, what we did is we applied an um, open circuit stimulus. So first we had our system operating uh, at that potential, around negative five. Um, and then we grabbed a sample. This was, uh, uh, this was our baseline sample. Then we let the system recover for a few minutes against that potential. You see the reduction in activity just because we reduced the surface area. We applied an open circuit condition, grabbed the sample, let it recover, uh, and then uh, we grabbed our last sample. Now, all of this happened in, in roughly a, you know, an hour period. So we're not letting the community change on its own. We're just looking at the transcriptional activity within this short period to see who's responding first. Um, so then we compared our metagenomic data to what we had seen on our 16S data. Uh, so this is um, uh, order and, and uh, phylum and class level uh, for the three sub-passages in, in our reactor A and B, um, as well as activity, methane, and current production through that, those time points. Uh, based on 16S, we had a higher relative abundance of methanogens in B, which is where we saw higher activity in general. Um, but when we looked at the, the metagenomes of both reactors, we actually see that the same players are there, um, but in different relative abundance, and there's a little bit more diversity uh, in reactor B. So where we had the best activity, we had more diversity. Uh, comparing across, uh, you know, another boring table, but, um, you know, we see Desil for Vibrio is a very dominant uh, population within our metagenome. Our methanogens in red here are only represented by three different um, specific strains, and they're, they're fairly low in the population, even though we do see fairly high methane production. Um, at the transcription level, uh, we see in the different reactors where we had different performance, um, different methanogens are responding. So uh, black bar is just the uh, presence of DNA, um, and then red, blue, and orange uh, represent the different conditions. Uh, baseline is red, open circuit shock is blue, and then the recovery is yellow. And what we see is that uh, while we, we have just general overall higher transcription in the baseline, when we induce that shock, no longer having an electron donor, uh, we see general trends of reducing transcriptional activity, and they, they don't ever come back, uh, which was different than what we saw at the anode. Now, looking at the pathways that were affected, you can see those that um, same trends show up. So, again, methanogens here, uh, baseline, open circuit, and then recovery, and we just see the same, same trends, not, not really recovering. Sulfate reducers didn't really respond very much, which was interesting. For us, uh, same thing you see in reactor B is an A. And we also looked at the fermentative populations. We see some differing trends uh, in, met in methane meta uh, metabolism for some of our clostridial strains. We actually saw an increase in activity in the open circuit condition. Maybe they're providing hydrogen, maybe they're doing some other fermentative activity. Still digging into it. So we see basically the same profiles in both reactors, which is nice. We've got reproducibility. Same bugs in both reactors, nice. We have reproducibility. But we still see changes in activity. Right? 
And so that seems to relate to who's responding and, and why. And we still don't have the why. Um, but what we did find out is after that 45 minute exposure to an open circuit condition, it took a really long time for that methanogenic community to recover its activity. So just 45 minutes without an electron donor in this type of system required a couple months to get back to baseline activities. So this has a this sort of thought-provoking from the perspective of climate change and electron donor availability from a mineral oxidation perspective. Um, would we see that same thing happen? Oh no. But um, what what we what we do know from uh, from from this study is that you know that the taxonomy um, does does change. Uh, we start to uh, enrich again for methanogens over time. This is again just based on 16s uh, when we see our recovery happen. So electron donor limitations cause problems uh, in bioelectrochemical systems for methanogenesis release. We're exploiting that to our uh, advantage in sanitation devices. Um, Interspecies interactions are quite dynamic, and we're still trying to tease that apart. And there's still many more questions to answer about mechanisms, but we're, we're gaining a little bit more insight. So what does this mean for, for future work? Well, you know, we know that uh, we can induce a perturbation. It can be a redox perturbation. It could be light, temperature, pH, salinity, you name it. Uh, we can characterize that dynamic functional response over short periods to see, okay, who are the first responders to this? Um, and then we can, we can look at that in time to see if those first responders actually take over the community and become the dominant organisms of the community. Um, we can, we can apply more omics, uh, approaches to try and understand, uh, metabolic effects. Uh, and then ultimately we want to know, okay, do these changes induce temporary or catastrophic changes? And, you know, this may lead to a greater understanding of ecological response. And from my perspective, uh, toward developing technologies, this helps us design systems around how to control the microbial communities. And so that'll, that'll be the last part of my talk is, okay, now we know a little bit about um, material interactions between our microbial communities, how we can drive metabolism to be a little bit faster just by uh, increasing electron flow out of the system. And we can, we can stop methanogenesis at a cathode um, by applying a very short open circuit perturbation. So we've applied all of these things to developing these systems. And specifically, we're interested in this whole water energy nexus area. So uh, you need water for energy, right? You need water for cooling towers, hydropower, renewable fuels, fossil fuels extraction, fracking, creating a lot of wastewater. We don't know what to do with it. Um, but also, we need energy for treating our water. Uh, wastewater treatment and drinking water. Uh, the water cycle in the United States uh, consumes anywhere from 3 to 5 percent of our total domestic energy load every year. That's an enormous amount of power. And that includes wastewater treatment as well as water treatment and all the pumping and delivery. But we need a more cost-effective approach for how to do this. And when you're looking at wastewater treatment specifically, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes to that. And we need to start looking toward water recycling, direct water recycling. And Orange County uh, has, has been doing it for 20 years and very successfully. Um, and that means you're taking wastewater, you're treating it uh, to, to high quality potable water. In Orange County, at least, they're recharging an aquifer, right? And then that aquifer um, becomes the, the water resource for the community. So that's indirect potable reuse. We like direct potable reuse, which, well, you know, you don't necessarily um, have warm fuzzies, but the reality is all water is recycled. It doesn't matter how you do it or how you think about it. Every drop of water that you use every single day has been used billions and billions and billions of times before. You're already doing direct potable reuse. Okay. And in San Diego, which is where we are, we're downstream from 200 different wastewater treatment plants on the Colorado River. <laughs> we're drinking it in, right? And, and this is exactly what it is. Um, so we have black water, right? Uh, this, is, this is what we have to treat. Treating to gray water standards uh, is, is what's uh, typically done in San Diego. This is good for uh, industrial reuse, but not safe for human consumption. Um, and then ultimately, you can take that gray water 
and, and uh, through some disinfection and additional filtration steps, you can make it safe to drink again. And this can all happen in one plant. In San Diego, um, that process requires all of these different steps. Okay? Um, and so uh, the major cost of operation for that is in aeration. This is where most of the treatment happens. So I'll activate a sludge. And this is a biological process where the microbes, this, or the, the sludge, uh, utilize the oxygen that is infused into this tank. There's massive blowers. Um, the, the, the microbes uh, respire oxygen, eat up all of the waste organics, grow more of themselves, and create another waste stream, which is secondary sludge. That has to settle out. Um, the primary sludge has already settled out. Usually there's a chemical added, like um, iron chloride or alum, uh, so that all of those energy-rich solids settle, and you've got primary sludge and secondary sludge, which ultimately we have to do something with. Most treatment plants just landfill it. Anaerobic digestion is the only um, technology that we have in place right now to try and decrease some of that volume and maybe recover a little bit of energy. But anyway, all these processes have to take place, and then we have gray water, right? Most expensive process is right here. But what if we take away the oxygen? What if we can exploit the process that would happen under anaerobic digestion but get rid of the methane and just create direct electricity? And that's what we're trying to do, is all of those steps in one shot uh, using a bioelectrochemical system to do it. Um, by employing redox control over our microbes, right, expediting the oxidation of waste organics by moving energy out of the system as fast as possible. And when we do that, we're also generating direct electricity. We don't have to burn methane and, and uh, do the process of biogas purification and cogeneration. Um, and then we do bring on oxygen, but it's a natural diffusion process. We figured out how to make air-breathing cathodes uh, so that we don't have to have massive blowers and we can still take advantage of this uh, electrons, protons, oxygen being reduced to a new stream of water. So on one end, at the anode, right, we're, we're um, producing gray water. We're treating the black water that comes in, uh, producing gray water, carbon dioxide, producing a little byproduct of electricity, and if it's a four-electron reaction, which doesn't always proceed, but in the best-case scenario, we can actually generate new water. And so we've been working on this for a few years in my lab. Uh, we actually had a, a, a pilot demonstration at White Labs yeast production facility, um, and we were taking extremely high load wastewater from their fermentation process. If you're not familiar with White Labs, they produce pitchable yeast. Um, and they sell that to Ballast Point, and um, they sell that to Stone Brewery and, and Home Brewers as well. That's how they started. And so you can imagine that the effluents come out, coming out of the fermentation process at massive volume. You've got a lot of unfermented sugars, you've got a lot of suspended solids, and our measure of how contaminated the water is is chemical oxygen demand. Okay, in a sewer, typical chemical oxygen demand in the United States is around 350 milligrams per liter. The wastewater coming out of White Labs is around 70,000 milligrams per liter COD. <laughs> so we had our work cut out for us. Uh, we had this in operation for about a year. Uh, and with the contract um, that we have with the Navy, Stay War in San Diego, uh, we're, we're looking at a completely off-grid installation uh, for treating wastewater in you know, military camps. Um, so we have our little system here. Uh, we've got a few solar cells to provide um, the, the extra power we might need. Uh, and then we changed out all of our pumps to be DC pumps so we don't lose a lot in the conversion. And this has been working for a couple months. And we also have another uh, system at uh, San Pasquale High School, which is up in Escondido, California. Uh, and we set up this system specifically to treat wine waste. So uh, students at the high school are responsible for raising the pigs. They have to clean the pig pen, which are concrete. Um, every day, they wash down all of the, the pig poop to us, and we treat it. And, uh, ultimately, we'll get to a point where we could recapture it and reuse it for watering the garden or washing down the pig pens again. So a few things happen when you go from lab to practice. Your tools change quite significantly. Your media vessels change quite significantly. And your highly qualified lab staff turn into construction workers. But 
we're happy to report that it works. Um, so we started our system uh, at the, the um, Escondido facility uh, in 2014, as when it was commissioned. Uh, we started with a, a dirt plot, and you can see our little pigs here. And uh, previously, all of the washdown went uh, directly to Escondido sewer, uh, where it was treated by conventional methods. And now this is this is our facility. The pigs are off the picture here. Uh, and the students wash into our underground sump, which then delivers into our reactors. Our reactors are these little guys here. They're about shoebox-sized devices, which we operate in series. Um, so the, the head works here. We've got wastewater coming in, gravity feeding through the boxes all the way through, and then clean water coming out. So it does take a while for things to work. Um, our version 1 through 4 reactor designs never made it out of the lab. Our version 5, uh, we piloted it um, up at San Pasqual. We produced more methane than anything else, which is not what we wanted. Our version 6, uh, we made some improvements over version 5, but we still hadn't figured out the headworks to do all the gravity feed and everything like that, so it still really didn't give us what we wanted. And now we're operating version 7, and we have been over the last eight months under continuous flow, and you can see our results. Uh, so this is the solids and everything else going in. After a four-hour residence time, this is what comes out. A conventional treatment plant can take eight to 12 hours of residence time with batch. Um, so we're doing this in four. And our treatment rate is anywhere from one to five kilogram per meter cube per day. Conventional treatment will max out usually between one and two. So it works. We have a smiley face on that one. And in um, about three weeks, we're going to be commissioning our first full-scale pilot in Tijuana, uh, utilizing the same reactor version. Uh, and we'll be running this throughout the year uh, in TJ, treating the municipal waste that's coming gravity-fed from this community here into Eco Parque. Uh, if any of you have been to TJ, when you cross the San Isidro border, it's the only green space that you see in the Tijuana hillside. Um, it's uh, run by El Colejo de la Frontera Norte, which is uh, uh, one of the schools in Baja, and this, this was set up specifically as an urban agriculture demonstration. They have a wastewater treatment plant there, which was installed in the early 90s based on trickle filtration. Not working the greatest, um, so we're hoping to um, replace that system. Ultimately. And we'll be testing it head-to-head -head with their existing over the next year. And ultimately, what we want to get to right, is, is, is solving a very big problem. Um, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, right, access to sanitation is one of the biggest problems facing the developing world and facing the eradication of diseases. Right? Um, one third of the world's population doesn't have access to adequate sanitation. That means they don't have access to an improved sanitation facility. Right? And this is often what the alternative is to open defecation. So this is an outhouse, essentially. right? This is where all the contents go, basically into this septic uh, open pond. And you can see cooking right nearby, right? laundry. This is the only option. But what we're hoping is that our little shoe boxes can fit into a system that looks like this, with a safe place for, for women especially to be able to use the facilities. Um, flush toilet, a little macerating pump, pumps up into our systems, cleans the water, have a disinfection unit, because we know people are ultimately going to drink it, even though it's just supposed to be gray water. Water storage, which you can drop chlorine tablets to keep uh, disinfected. And then you can reuse that water for flushing the toilet and washing hands. Now, this is the you know souped-up model. But we can always put wood planks on it and make it look less feelable. Um, and you don't have to have it right next door to each other, either. Uh, but this is ultimately the concept that we, that we want to deliver. So, um, it takes more than a village uh, <laughs> to, to do all of this. And so uh, I have to, to definitely uh, give a huge thank you to my team. Um, who they, they cross all of the different projects I talked to you about today and some more. Um, our collaborators uh, outside of JCVI, our engineering partners, D4C product development, all of our partnering institutions and, and uh, um, supporters who provided space and uh, intellectual property as well as uh, help with uh, public health uh, interventions and, and understanding what community needs really are where we're working. Um, and none of this would be possible without funding from the Roddenberry Foundation. So, thank you very much.
Uh, they were all engineering differences at that point. Um, and then the inoculum is always the wastewater because what we want to do is take naturally existing microorganisms that are already adapted to that waste and select for the electrogenic you know, communities that are already there. So the inoculum is always pretty much the same. We might introduce a higher level of diversity by uh, bringing in lagoon sediment so we can capture more across different redox environments and mix that all together. But still, that's a local resource. Um, how we run the enrichment, though, is part of the special sauce, uh, which came came out in version seven. Um, no, <laughs> we haven't figured that out yet. You can on the cathode. In our particular system now, no. It, the, the ammonia concentrations go down, and we think what's happening is animox reactions going on. Uh, we're not necessarily harvesting the energy from that, uh, but we are seeing um, ammonia nitrate and nitrite reduce in the So we don't have the nitrogen cycle figured out yet, but we, we have been tracking it. And the ammonia concentration is actually kind of nice for us because it acts as a buffer. Um, so it keeps it fairly neutral. Like our pH is around 8. Um, and uh, we see that fairly stable. No, you're right. Um, and thankfully, municipal wastewater doesn't have that. Happen. <laughs> but we do, we do, we do track that. Um, all of our effluents to date, and we need long-term validation, of course. But the effluents to date have been below WHO levels. We don't know. What we do know is that it's an anaerobic system. And aerobes do not stick around, and so when we when we do a phylogenetic analysis, uh, we don't see we don't see the typical groups right, that that we're hoping to get rid of. But there will always need uh, secondary treatment. We're always going to need disinfecting stuff. Very little at that point. <laughs> um, so the energy recovery portion has not really been our focus, uh, but but we want to get there. Um, Theoretically, if we can recover 30% of the energy coming in, um, you know, so chromic efficiency of 30%, then we will have enough energy to run a very low power pump. Right now, it's about a 1 to 2% chromic efficiency on the flying waste. In the lab, we've been able to accomplish up to 40% chromic efficiency. So we need, again, lab to practice. So, so question one, um, same materials that we use in the lab. So we're using uh, carbon cloths uh, formed into various different shapes and sizes to optimize the surface area to volume ratio. We want as much biofilm in there on our anodes as possible, but we can't have any clogging, right? So we had to get creative with how we make our anode electro design. Uh, the cathodes, the same thing. Um, the uh, It's a carbon cloth substrate, really high surface area, and we use a, a catalytic of activated carbon and carbon black um, to drive the oxygen reduction system. Um, most microbial fuel cell researchers that are working in the lab scale, you still use platinum, right? That, that's not going to fly. <laughs> um, in terms of energy applied to the system, we don't, we don't for the field study. We've tried it, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. So we're doing those tests right now. Um, our standard is a month startup time before we go to continuous flow. Uh, we just put a system on that was um, just allowed two weeks in batch, and we, we put it into flow uh, this last week. So far, we haven't seen any problems with that, but we got to look at it over the long um, We have seen um, lactococcus and uh, a few others in there that we, uh, we actually isolated. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, we, we isolated lactococcus, um, but now I'm questioning whether that's a grand positive. Okay. <laughs> I've heard this term about this. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's the only one we've isolated and really started to um, characterize. But we're not really sure what it's doing besides the fermentation. <laughs> <laughs>